All right, wonderful, everyone. So we just started the recording. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm excited to welcome you to uh, the webinar, Unlocking Energy Savings to Fund Campus Upgrades. This will be a case study with Metris and the University of Northwestern Ohio, UNOH. Um, I'm very excited to welcome everyone today. Uh, because we have a lot of great content, we're just going to go ahead and get started here right away. I can see people trickling into the room. So thank you again for joining us. I'm going to introduce our panelists and then Brian from Metris Energy will go through a presentation to uh, kind of introduce the uh, kind of project uh, overview of what we'll be talking about today. And then we'll turn it over to uh, Jim and Mark, um, and why don't I go ahead and introduce each of them, and then we'll uh, go ahead and get started here. So uh, before I do that, I guess I should introduce myself. So I'm Bridget Flynn, a Senior Manager of Climate Programs at Second Nature, and Metris Energy is one of our partners. Very excited to have them explain uh, some of the great work that they do and highlight this case study that should be very educational for um, all of our audience here and um, hopefully you can do something similar if you're interested at your campus. Um, so one note of housekeeping before we get started is please put your questions into the Q&A and we will answer all of them after the overview. So at the very bottom of your screen, um, you'll see a, a little icon that says Q&A and that's where we'll be handling all the question and answer. And uh, we will um, be able to uh, upvote each of them. So if you have a similar question or really want to hear the answer to a question that someone else posed, uh, please go ahead and upvote them and we will answer um, all of them that we can get to at the end of the call. So during the overview, please feel free to uh, put your Q&A there and we can also even bring people on screen if we would like as well. So um, I will go ahead and without further ado, introduce each of our panelists. So Brian McCommon is from Metris Energy. Brian is the Director of Sales and works with healthcare industry and commercial clients and educational uh, clients as well. Mark Weiss is the uh, Senior Account Executive at Centrica Business Solutions, working with local government, K-12, private higher ed as well. And Jim Bronner is from the University of Northwestern Ohio. Jim is the controller and has been with UNOH for 26 years. Um, so without further ado, I think I'll turn it over to Brian McCommon to give an overview of Metris Energy's offerings and get us started here with the case study. Great. Thank you, Bridget. Um, so just a quick agenda uh, walkthrough. So first, we'll do a little uh, bit about Metris. Uh, then we'll talk about our approach. And then we'll step through the case study for UNOH uh, with Jim and, and Mark, kind of go through the details. And then what that'll do, <clears throat> that'll open us up for some good panel questions and Q&A uh, with the group. Most of those will be uh, geared towards Jim and Mark, but um, just really wanted to uh, to get put the agenda out there. Um, a little bit about us. So Metris was founded in 2009. Um, really the goal was to provide a dedicated energy efficiency financing solution. Um, at our core, Metris is a purpose-driven company uh, focused on helping the higher education sector decarbonize faster and at scale. Uh, it's better for your business, it's better uh, and the planet. Um, it's why we exist. If you ever get an opportunity to talk to our CEO, Bob, he will reiterate that uh, to you as well. Um, <clears throat> so what do we do? We fund, we implement, and own energy efficiency retrofits that are entirely paid for through the energy savings of the project. Uh, we partner with lending lead lender, or me, leading lenders and ESCOs to install and maintain best-in-class energy efficiency equipment and technology. We pioneered, uh, excuse me, we pioneered energy as a service. Um, our pay-for-performance model, in which customers uh, benefit from the sustainable energy solutions without having to pay for energy efficiency upgrades or own the equipment. That's really what launched the energy as a, as a service uh, industry, as a new way to finance these projects that were taking on traditional ways of financing and taking on debt. Um, below here, this will highlight some stuff um, from GuideHouse uh, as far as the market research where it's a $27 billion market by 2029. And the US DOE 
has launched programs, um, energy as a service programs, including the Better, Better Building Challenge and Better Climate Challenge, in which both metrics uh, are heavily involved in. You just need a bunch of stuff that don't have enough money to do everything. Guidehouse has an estimated $27 billion by 2029. And the DOE has launched an energy as a service uh, program, including the Better Building Challenges, as well as the Better Climate Challenge, in which uh, Metris is both involved in. Okay, uh, we'll start one, two, three. We'll start on the left. I'll try to walk us through how what we do and how it benefits um, the customer. All right, so if we start at one, what do we do? We fund 100% of that cost of the upgrade of your equipment to become more uh, efficient. That's super important because the customer does not pay for any of these upgrades up front. Um, how does it benefit the customer? You get brand new upgraded equipment for zero zero dollars up front. Um, it's treated as an off balance sheet, uh, excuse me, an off balance sheet solution, uh, in which preserves any type of capex budget that you may have for future projects or projects that you know have been on the sidelines that just need that money to, to have access to that money. Um, Step number two, uh, what we do, we manage the energy efficiency retrofit from soup to nuts. It's based upon your wish list of upgrades, um, but it's also we try to incorporate as many things as we can looking at the building or campus as a whole or multi-campus solutions to ensure that we're providing the best, you know, full service offer rather than just a one-off uh, install. How this benefits the customer, you accelerate your program towards the net zero goals without worrying about any project implementation. Uh, Jim maybe can speak to this a little bit later. Um, everybody's busy with their day-to-day -day jobs. Um, putting a task onto them to take on a big energy project um, seems like a big one. So that's what Metris and our partners do. We manage it. Uh, we, we, we make sure the program that is in, in put in place um, is the right one for each customer. All right, finally, step number three, what we do. So we own and maintain the equipment. Uh, we report on performance. Um, so savings is obviously there, and then the greenhouse uh, gas reductions, um, annual uh, monitoring and, uh, uh, excuse me, me measurement and verification, MV reporting is done to ensure that the system is, is actually performing the way that we expected it to. We slide to the right. It hits on my point earlier. You pay for only realized energy savings, right? So if the system is performing the way we expected it to, you're going to pay those realized savings. If there is any type of lull in the performance of the system, uh, the end customer only pays for the actual savings of the project. So you read the benefits of the improved operational reliability, obviously that lowered energy use, and the reduced greenhouse gas em emissions. All right, 14 years experience. Um, I'll kind of breeze through this, but, you know, we're in 32 states, 30, I think it's maybe more than this now, but 30 different types of energy and water, uh, water efficiency upgrades. Um, you can see we focus on KWH, uh, therms, and water. Uh, these numbers here kind of highlight uh, some, of, some of our track record over the, the past 14 years. All right, so our approach, so we believe the answer lies within. So the way that we get there, we take an energy efficiency first approach to finding the answer to decarbonization within your building or multiple buildings. <clears throat> so our comprehensive assessment of your built environment uh, unlocks all the opportunity for energy savings. So your equipment can be upgraded, again, without any upfront cost. Okay, so this, this plays well with this previous slide. I'll jump to the bottom first. You can see um, it's not just a lighting retrofit. It's not just um, a chiller. We, whatever the, the, the campus or the building or a customer needs, we try to look at it and say, hey, you know, is this a program that you guys are looking to develop? What's the pain point? Is there, are there things that we can also look at from a water efficiency standpoint to fold into the project? So multiple different measures. Um, and when we look at UNOH case study, we'll see uh, how many measures we actually deployed during that project. Um, so if we slide back up to the top, the Sustainable Energy Services Agreement um, is the proprietary financing solution for bundling all of that equipment, all the technology, the maintenance, the monitoring that you need into one flexible contract to achieve portfolio-wide results. Um, so as I mentioned, if it's, say, a university has multiple campuses in different parts of the city or different parts of the county, 
you can look at those as one project as well. You can fold those into the same master's or uh, sustainable energy services agreement and put those into one uh, total contract with Metris. All right, this is a busy slide, so hopefully everybody doesn't get scared of it, but it's a little bit busy, admittedly. So we'll walk through this. Uh, so what we're trying to do is just create the value throughout the project life cycle. So we're here today. There's project design. There's a detailed engineering report. We need to do that assessment. We need to do that analysis. And we need to get the insights from the customer, right? We're not just coming in and telling you, telling the customer, this is what you got to do. We got to learn from you, the customer, and see what your needs are. And then we project design a detailed engineering based upon those findings. Findings. <clears throat> so during that construction uh, side of it, you're getting a project deployed. You're not spending any, any capital from day one. And then you're getting that initial energy savings. And where that kind of plays in is if we look at a multi-measure uh, site, say some simple measures is like a lighting or a water retrofit is being deployed early on in the project. And then say we got some more challenging HVAC or more challenging chiller boiler situations that take longer during construction. The customer will get that initial realized energy savings for no additional cost until the full project's done. All right, I'm gonna speed through this as quick as I can. Uh, very important here, you get new upgraded equipment. Um, that's super important to highlight. You get the reduced GHG emissions, you get the enhanced built environment for uh, your students, your faculty, um, improved balance sheet, not taking on debt, operational cost is, is reduced, you get operational resiliency with new equipment. You also have the added maintenance services. That's, that's, a, that's a point that's not negotiated, discussed with the customer and see which route they wanna go as far as the full maintenance program. And then the detailed project monitoring, it's very important for your customer to understand how the project's doing. Um, I'm sure certain people at different organizations don't care, but the facilities person does, the CFO does, and sustainability folks do. So I'm the controllers, right, Jim? So you want to make sure that everybody's uh, comfortable with how the system's doing. Um, and then in result, you know, if there's ex uh, sustainability goals that are in place by the university or, 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 or whatever business, this helps you accelerate it, right? You know, you have these lofty goals for whatever year, putting multi-measures together allow us to get there faster. Um, last point here, the utility spin here is where we are today. During that initial construction, you're gonna have some reduced cost and operational uh, spend. And then we're gonna do that energy uh, service charge, that, that shared paid model with metrics throughout the term of the contract, depends on the, the term sheet, it's either seven to 20 years, whatever it may be. And then at the end of that project, you are going to reap the benefits uh, of the continued value and your utility spend um, will drop to the baseline. All right, as promised, you were almost done here. Um, so our simple process for project development, um, we utilize an interactive, uh, excuse me, an iterative, inter in iterative uh, customer-centric uh, process to develop projects in our, or identify equipment that are in need of replacing. Uh, so we like to bundle the energy, the water efficiency measures to fund the upgrades that maximize the savings. I feel like I'm repeating myself, but that's just where we really fit well with our, our financing model. We'll go left to right, remote energy audit. We offer a free remote assessment. What that is, we're going to ask for some baseline information for whatever building or whatever campus. We're going to do a, a very quick assessment of potential energy savings. We're going to say, yes, this looks like we could save X amount of dollars. Can we get boots on the ground? What will happen, we'll do an initial on-site project assessment. We'll look at the equipment. At that point, we'll, we'll make some equipment recommendations, potential project scope. Um, and then the next step would be to design a project development agreement between the customer and Metris. And what that does, that allows us, that opens us up to what is called an investment grade audit or an IGA, if you've heard of it before. This is where things get serious as far as numbers go. That's where we find the final on-site project scope. We do the detailed, detailed contract review. We outline the expected savings. We outline the equipment. And then we finalize the term length based upon where we land from an uh, energy savings standpoint and cost. Everybody agrees to that, shakes hands. We sign the sustainable energy service agreement. And then that's when the pr uh, project construction begins. Um, I can't give you a, a, a timeline on project construction. If, if it's simple, it could be, you know, a lighting project, but if you do multi-measures, um, you know, Jim and Mark can kind of speak to a little bit on, on their case study uh, that we'll fold into next as far as their, their project goes. 
Um, this is the remote energy uh, assessment. If there's any, you know, urgency or if there's any need for, for or want for us to, to provide that service to you, you can see it's not that big of a, a document. Um, but a lot of times the facilities person, the sustainability person at the university helps drive those conversations internally to get the, the information we need. So we'll do that. We'll complete the form. We'll do the consultation call. Once we do that assessment, it's an audit result presentation, as we looked at on the previous slide, leading into, you know, initial onsite follow-up. Okay. All right. So um, that was kind of the, the about metrics. Um, you know, if there's any questions, we can address those towards the end. Um, but I want to jump in here to the UNOH case study. Um, Jim, I don't know if you want to speak to it or I can, I can walk through this. It's up to you. You can go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, good deal. So I'm just going to be efficient with it. We're just going to call it UNOH for today. Uh, it was founded in 1920. They provide 50 programs across five colleges, including uh, leading app, uh, applied technology college with a focus on automotive technologies. And their campus is located in Lima, Ohio. Lima. So enrollment's about Lima, Lima, Ohio. Yeah, okay. You know, I was going to butcher that one. Um, so there are about 4,000 students, uh, campus acreage, uh, acreage two, 200 uh, square feet. Um, main campus facilities is about 28 buildings, I believe. Uh, annual usage is about two, uh, 10 million kWh. Okay. So this is where we'll start talking about uh, the project review. So the UNOH pushed for efficiency and HVAC improvements in 2021. So RTUs and LED lighting were a key focus. Uh, Centrica Business Solutions performed the prelim audit and the IGA or investment grade audit that we talked about earlier. Um, summer of 2022 is when the Sustainable Energy Service uh, Agreement uh, was signed. The impl implementation is underway. And it looks like we're going to wrap up in May, but I'll let Jim and Mark kind of speak to that a little bit more. Um, but expected unit savings annually, um, you know, KWH uh, in gallons are outlined there below. Jim, Mark, do you guys have anything you want to add to this slide? Or? Could you I maybe tell uh, folks no. what an RTU is? R R rooftop unit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It and there are many rooftop units at the University of Northwestern Ohio. One of the great things about at that stage in the process when we first started talking to Jim was he really knew his criteria. So he was a customer that had, or an owner who had planned. And we always talk about the importance of planning your future. And I know for private higher ed, that's a big focus. We see a lot of our, our owners and customers that have uh, plans master plans for the university. It was great walking in, in, in the, even from the first call, having Jim again and the president and the director of operations aligned with the mission. So I, I would tell you, as we go into this conversation, that was a big part of it. Yep. Um, <clears throat> this is just a little bit better job, I think, capturing some of the some of the project values here, um, but we landed at a 15-year term uh, because of the RTUs and some of the, the challenges and avoided cost of power. But 15-year term is, is reasonable. Um, like we said, we're going to replace critical assets on campus. It's going to help address that deferred maintenance uh, that Mark was mentioning to provide an overall healthier and more comfortable facilities for students and staff. Um, project scope is highlighted to the left here. Five different measures: um, lighting, HVAC, water and sewer, and controls. Um, you can see we partner with Centrica here. Um, so Centrica is the ESCO. They build, they construct uh, the whole project for us, and then we come in and fund the project um, as the project owner. So in this case here, the investment made by Metris was $3.1 million. Um, I highlight that because UNOH did not spend a dollar to implement the program. Annual energy savings expected just over $350,000 a year. Uh, metric tons, 957, carbon countdown to 0.31. Um, okay. Yeah, Brian, can I talk to that real quick? This is just kind of a... Yeah, absolutely. 
you know, when we go into a customer, you know, our mission is to maximize the business case and cash flow that we can get done. It has to be, again, driven from the savings that you mentioned. So it's a benefits driven or savings driven solution that has to be engineered and then cash flowed. And so, again, in our knowing our customers, oftentimes they want us to maximize, get as much work as we can get done to fund. But this project was no money out of pocket and positive cash flow from day one. So it kind of does both. And, you know, again, the customer doesn't want to keep a bunch of that cash. I don't think not to speak for Jim, but, but the idea would be to get as much work as you can get done. Definitely. Especially with us using our funds. Yeah, it's a great, great point, Mark. You know, we, we, our money does a really good job when you look at, when we look at it from that perspective, right? We start looking at how do we spread our capital across multiple sites, multiple solutions, because our cost, you know, baked in cost is going to be roughly the same, whether it's a million dollars or north of $3 million, right? So if we look at it and say, can we implement a program and still use our capital, our cash rather than yours and get way more stuff done than just say, just pin RTUs? You know, like, can we do all of the RCUs and all of the water and still you get the, you still get an operational benefit or a cost saving benefit at the end of the day? Yeah, it's a good point, Mark. Um, I won't, I won't dig into this too much, but you know, the environment, environmental benefits are there. These are super important. I don't mean to downplay them at all. Um, but it just shows, you know, you, you know, if UNOH wants to highlight the impact that they're making with the project, um, they can always come to Metris. We can provide them the details of the, the, the CO2 reporting, or the energy savings reportings on an annual basis. Um, and then that way, you know, it's a feel good for the community there. You know, Jim, you know, you, stamp, you, you did the project. You know, you've saved X amount of dollars. You saved X amount of trees. You've done the CO2 reduction for the, for the university. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a feel good moment uh, for you. Okay, how do we do on time? That's not terrible, right? 23 minutes, 25 minutes, something like that? Yeah, so we're in pretty good shape. Okay, Looks good. Um, so I think what we wanna do now, Bridget, we wanna go through some of those panel questions. I think you're gonna to drive to, to Jim and Mark and um, yeah, thank you so much. I'll, do you mean to leave this screen up or do you mean to close it out? Um, if you Probably can close, close it, it out. out for now, um, then everyone can see. Yep. Um, Jim and Mark a little bit better. Uh, that would be wonderful. Yep. And then we can pull up um, at the very end, uh, your last slide with your contact information. That would be perfect. Awesome. Um, yeah. So I think the first question um, is for you, Jim, if you could just talk through like what made this project happen? What challenges were you facing when you embarked on this journey? Like if you could just kind of start us with how it came to be, that would be super helpful. Well, one of the biggest issues was, and I think it's for all colleges, is declining number of students attending. So with less students, we were always looking for ways to reduce our expenses and utilities being a major cost that we were looking for the energy savings there, especially with the LED lighting. And we had multiple people come to us and we just didn't want to pay for the equipment or the fixtures. So this was an excellent way to take care of that part. And our facilities guy was excited because of the HVAC units. And then we're probably in a unique situation where we're part of the campus is in the city, part of it's in the county. And the county has a surcharge for water and sewer because they get their water from the city. So we are able to incorporate some water savings save some additional funds. The other big part I want to mention because of that 3.1 that they're investing, since we're so heavily in the automotive, we spend that close to that amount every year on training aids. We need to buy cars, semis, uh, a combine can be 60 to $70,000 for one for our students to work on. So saving that money to be able to put it into the education is what we needed. 
That's fantastic. Very good to hear. Um, it sounds like you mentioned your facilities director had um, some ideas or things that they were kind of needing out of this project too. So from a facilities uh, sort of perspective, what were some of the drivers for um, the projects you chose to address? A lot of his were some of the uh, rooftop units, some of the controls, some of the fans, and some of the units that may have been more updated but wanted variable speeds, et cetera. Um, he was very much wanting, wanting to work on those. And I think Mark was able to come up with a pretty decent plan on that for him. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I'm curious, so, you know, I mean, such an interesting thing to be able to do a $3 million project and not have to pay any of that money up front um, or at, at all to uh, get it to happen. So I was curious, like, why was that the right solution for um, UNOH? Well, it allowed us to save our funds to use for the training aids that we want to use to, so we continually have the updated equipment. But then it's also it was off, off, off book financing, so we didn't have to reflect any additional debt. We also did a bond offering during the same project, and it made everything tie together very nicely. So we tied all of our debt into one offering, and we're all set now for the going forward. Fantastic! That's great to hear, and. Maybe now I'll ask um, Mark a couple questions, and I see um, we might be getting a few things in the Q and A. So, folks, please uh, do feel free to type into um, the Q and A questions that you have, and we'll turn to those um, here in a few minutes. Um, so, Mark, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you got involved in the project and what the process uh, looked like for you? Well, again, I, I'll tell you that when we got involved in the process, it was nice because, again, to Jim's point, Steve Brown, the director of operations and facilities, had a list of compelling needs that he wanted to have addressed. And in fact, at some of those projects in, in the work that were put on, on hold because of financing. So they might have started even on one or two of them, but they got, they got stopped. So what happened was we were able to use the savings from the lighting's benefits as well as uh, the domestic water benefits from from the improvements we were making to drive or fund the solutions for uh, controls in HVAC that Jim was talking about that were so compelling and critical to the university. Great. Um, and how did you arrive at the uh, final project scope working with uh, Metris and UNOH? Well, it's a really, it's a really a clear and transparent process, and it's a true partnership. We're working closely uh, with the customer and with the financier so that everyone has a say in the project scope. It's really important that we're working uh, as a partner with the customer to make sure that we're addressing their critical needs. Our financing partner, Metris, wants to have that accomplished as well. Uh, Obviously, you want to get as much work done and help the customer as much as possible. But we also want to make sure that the improvements that we make are going to do what we say they're going to do. So that's really important. So all of that is um, verifiable during that process where we're actually developing the project out to 80%. And that's what Brian referred to earlier. It's really been uh, the rubber meets the road. We're really working closely with the customer and basically baking your engineering project complete. Yeah, that's good to good to learn. Um, so, in order to actually get this project to happen, um, especially you know a scope of three million dollars on you know a campus with four thousand students and twenty eight buildings, that's a pretty you know, large, sizable project. So I imagine there were some, you know, kind of barriers along the way or some things that needed to get figured out. So could you tell us a little bit about um, what are the kind of measures or the um, things that got it over the finish line and got us, uh, got you able to actually implement the project? Yeah, absolutely. That lighting project and, and again, the domestic water 
a university does house more than a thousand students on campus and certainly the water in that area of the state of Ohio is, is can be expensive. So Jim mentioned earlier, there's a difference in price between both the city and the county. And we were able to take advantage of some of that price differentiation and help the customer back. Uh, so we're making them more efficient, which is saving them on their bill. Fantastic. Um, so I'm sure everyone is also wondering where, where are we at now with implementation? So uh, Mark and Jim, if you could tell us uh, kind of where we're at now. Well, I know on the LED, I think they're pretty close to being done. They took maybe all 10 minutes in my office and the hallway to get all the fixtures changed. So it went very quick. And even when they did the water in the restrooms back here, I don't think we were down for more than a 15, 20 minutes of each bathroom. They were very wow. quick and professional. Thank you. That's good to hear, Jim. Uh, yeah, so that's exciting, and, and, and that's how we wanted to go. And tell you that there are improvements that didn't make the list. So we continue to talk about that as, as we go forward, looking at the opportunity in the future that we may be able to help with. Uh, but we're expecting to close this project in May. And one of the biggest challenges in today's market is uh, our getting our equipment in. We're having challenges with lead times, and that's the world we live in. So, you know, we want to make sure that we under promise and over deliver for our customers. So I think in the end, we're all going to be happy with the project and the, and the close date. But right now it's targeted, I think, for May 5th. Fantastic. That's great to hear and uh, fun to hear, Jim, when you can actually see things changing and also that it didn't have a lot of disruption on campus. That's always a good thing when infrastructure projects aren't a total inconvenience. So that's really wonderful to hear. They've worked with the plant department and some of the buildings were done maybe after hours or in the evenings when there was no students or no staff in there. Um, so it was very, I'm going to say painless, seemed to go very quick. I see their trucks around campus all the time. That's great to hear. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing five questions in the uh, Q&A. So I think it would be wonderful if we wanted to um, kind of transition in our last 25 minutes to uh, our audience question. So I'm going to start with the first one uh, from Christine, which is why a 15 year term um, she said the savings look like they might pay back sooner. So why the 15 year term? Start with yeah, Mark. I'll take that one. Um, so yeah, or Mark, if you want to start it, I'll finish it. Run. Yeah, okay. Um, so there's a lot of different factors that go into uh, our financing model, um, credit being one of them. Um, you know, private universities, uh, have a different credit rating than some of the Fortune 500 customers we work with. Uh, so that plays into our discount rate that we're able to offer. Um, every customer has a little bit different uh, credit profile. So based upon that, we have to put that in factor into our model. Um, and then we also have the ability to manipulate the energy savings ratio. Um, in order to get GEM and UNOH a little bit more energy savings cut out of it, we extended the term out a little bit further so that they could actually get a little bit more money in their pocket and they were actually comfortable with it. Um, I think if we were to really chop it up, we probably could have got down to like 12 to 13 years, but if we could squeeze a little bit more cash in Jim and UNOH's pocket um, for a few more years and, and the customer accepted, we said yes, and so did, so did UNOH. I see the second one, Bridget. Do you want me to, or Mark or Jim, do you guys have anything to add to that? I'm good with that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And the second one is about the steam chilled water campus. Yeah, yeah we, we can definitely do that. And we'll, we'll give you the, the yeah, we, we all work in that, that space. So we can give you our contact information and we can follow up. Great. So the next question is, does Metris own and maintain all of the equipment for the term of the agreement? And how does day-to-day -day maintenance work? What happens after the term is completed? This is a question from Martha. 
Hey, yes, good, good question, Martha. Um, before I dig into that, I think I'll, I may have skipped over a little bit of the contracting uh, inner works, I guess is a way to, bad way to describe it, but Metris is contracted, or UNOH is contracted de directly with Metris. Metris has a contract with Centrica ensuring the, the performance values, everything that the contractor is promising on the project, we have a contract on the side with them. Um, so I'm sorry if I didn't elaborate on that a little bit further, but to answer the question, yes, we do uh, own and uh, operate and maintain um, the equipment throughout the term. If it's a five year or 20 year, that's part of our responsibility. Um, so the, the, the maintenance work is really just dependent upon how the, uh, the, the, the M and V reporting showing is the system actually performing on a, on a, on a uh, measurement verification standpoint to a point where if we need to make uh, you know, have a service call, then in this case, we, you know, reach out to Centrica and say, hey, the system seems to be failing, you know, make a make a service call. But it's not really a day to day, uh, but it's more of if there if there is a problem that's noticed that we are not aware of, then, you know, we're we're the person, the company that you would contact. Um, hopefully that answers that. And then end of term, there's a couple different, I guess, options. One, um, so since we've been around 14 years, we've seen you know, many of our contracts go through a cycle. So at the end of, end of a contract, there is the opportunity to buy that system, whatever it is for fair market value. We, we show a fair market value in the cash flow during the presentation, during, during the, the conversations with the customer. Um, so at, in this case with UNOH, at, at the end of the term here, they're going to negotiate and say, hey, we would like to buy this equipment for X amount of dollars. Uh, that's one option. They can extend it, you know, in some cases, you know, the term link comes up and the customer says, oh, you know, I kind of kind of slipped my mind. Can we extend it a year? Can we extend it two years? So there's an extension option there, renegotiated rates at that time. And then also um, the third option, which doesn't seem uh, like a good option for anybody, any party involved is say, I don't want this equipment, come out and remove it. Um, and if, that, if, if that's the case, then Metris is on the line to come out and remove that equipment which um, I don't know why anybody would take that option, but that's that, those are the, the three options there. Thank you, Brian, that's helpful. And yeah, great question, Martha. Um, I think especially given the financial structure of the agreement, you know, you have a vested interest in making sure that the equipment is working um, so that everyone is seeing the savings um, being maximized uh, for the project. So that's a really cool way that the structure makes the maintenance um, you know, you have a stake in actually making sure that things are up to par. So um, really great to hear about that. Um, so I'll read the next question here so that our um, recording audience will be able to um, hear what was happening. So the next question is, how are the realized energy savings calculated for projects with smaller scopes? Um, specifically, this person was asking about for those campuses without smart metering, um, they've been limited in analyzing the effectiveness of energy savings projects. So how would you handle um, a campus with uh, those kind of stipulations? Mark? Yeah, that's, that's, that's your wheelhouse, yeah? Yeah. How did we lose them? I don't see it any different than our typical process. Uh, one of the things that we're looking for uh, is, uh, you know, projects that'll that'll create savings pathways. So it is important. Some customers don't have the size of infrastructure requirements that might uh, necessitate an ESA or energy as a service contract. Brian, do you have a cap on or minimum on the size of project that you're willing to look at? Because for us in the ESCO industry, we're typically saying it's going to take a million dollars or more. And the reason we would say that, everyone, is because you're going to have a, a, a cost in engineering and designing and developing a project. And so uh, whether that's a million or a $10 million project, it's kind of almost the same once you apply those resources in the field from an engineering perspective. So... We would tell you that it's much easier to develop a larger project because it's easier to find improvements that are going to pay for themselves. And if you don't use enough, then you may not have that 
but at the same time, it's still cash flow principles. So you're saying, okay, if I improve my lights and they save me a thousand dollars a month, I could use that money to pay for something else. So that it, you know, theoretically, again, it's our we're, we're going to apply the same principles uh, from an engineering standpoint, also a finance standpoint. Uh, it's just a, a question of whether or not the cash flow business case makes sense to the customer because of the limitations that might be apparent when we're dealing with less infrastructure improvement opportunity. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, just to, like you mentioned, Mark, I mean, you're right. I mean, million dollars is kind of like our say starting point. I mean, if it's close to it and it's like a screaming good deal from like, if it's just lighting and it's just like ton of savings and it makes sense, then maybe, um, but a uh, million dollars is a good, I think our average, I'm going to round up. It's like four, it's 4.5, 4.7 million in our portfolio for contract size. Um, you know, we've done stuff, you know, up to 20 plus million dollars and stuff, you know, just north of a million. So I think to, um, so curious, would it be related to this question? Um, not just on the scope of the project, but um, in terms of the metering, uh, how do you, like, how, how are you evaluating the realized energy savings? Um, if it's not like by building, would it be through utility bills or um, estimates based on the specs of the equipment that you're installing? Um, if you could speak to that, that might be helpful for people in the audience. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. So there is an agreed upon baseline that's established uh, from the beginning of the project to say, hey, the, the equipment that's being uh, that was here, this, this let's just say, what well, this building is operating at this efficiency value, and this is how many KWHs it used last year. Assuming that your operational uh, standards stay the same, right? You know, you know, your your lights are going on. Your you know the student bodies coming in and out of the facility are roughly going to be the same. And there's no drastic change. There's a, there's a baseline that's established. And then you take that baseline number and whatever improvement of efficiency of equipment, whether it be an RPU, a, a VFD or variable uh, frequency drive or a new, new water faucet or whatever, you factor into those uh, operational values. And then that's how you come up with the, um, you know, the expected savings. And then you do that me measurement verification report on an annual basis that is super important for, for Mark and my team to work on because what that does, his team does the M&V, they kick it over to our engineering team, they go back and forth to make sure all the calculations are correct, and then we come back to the customer and say, here's how the system actually did perform on an annual basis. If there is challenges with smart metering, yeah, I mean, a, a calculation of a bill, it's a little bit more granular, but um, yeah, there has to be an established baseline of operational hours and that kind of gives us a really good starting point. I don't know if you, you agree with that, Mark, or you have anything to add? I do. Yeah, thanks for explaining that. And I'll tell you, too, that that's, you know, you negotiate that. Um, so the customer is going to be, yep. again, a partner in that process. And, and one of the things I would tell you if you're sitting there wondering whether or not you've got an opportunity is that you could look at your gas, water, and electric spend. And you could say, okay, if my equipment's 15 years or older, or if you know your domain, you already know that. But when 15 years or older, I could say 30% or 20% from an energy efficiency standpoint, maybe average five. You might look to then on your tolerance from a, a return on investment point over the years from a term standpoint. I'm just saying that that's, you know, may help. Um, so a listener out there, do some internal investigation. I don't know if everyone is able to get that response. It was a little bit um, choppy. So maybe um, if you could kind of reiterate uh, by um, in the Q&A, um, there's a way that you can type an answer that would also be super helpful in case um, some folks missed that. Um, okay, so I think we have a, f yeah, we still have a few more questions, so I'm going to keep them going here. So the next one is with the lighting portion of the project where LED tube retrofits used or new LED fixtures. Uh, 
I want to say we had new fixtures as well as the lights. Went in. I believe that to be the case. I think Mark, is that correct? We got a mix, yeah, mixture to maximize um, and satisfy uh, tier one requirements from a, also an, ed, an engineered solution that allows for both. Great, so it sounds like a little bit of a mix, but definitely fixtures, awesome. Um, okay, so this one is kind of a two-parter. Thank you uh, for asking these two questions. So the next one is, um, are your financial models taking into account government funding tools? So better buildings, better climate, um, any sort of government funding tools. And then there's a next part uh, based on your answer that we'll ask too. Yeah, so good question. No, we don't. So the way that we operate depends on the contract value um, and other factors of, of credit uh, worthiness. But so we use our own equity and then we use debt as well. That percentage is going to change project to project. Um, so no, we don't um, use better buildings or better climate. Um, the second parter, um, how do I think? So the IRA for us doesn't work um, because we own the assets. Um, you know, the customer can't take take those benefits too because we own the assets. But the customer wants to use the IRA to do the project. They own that asset, then they get benefit from the IRA. Uh, for, for where we live in our, our model space, um, we, we are not able to, uh, to see the value there. Utility incentives is a, is a whole different thing. Uh, anytime there's an incentive on the, on, the, on the table, that is really attractive for our, our, our modeling. Um, you know, it, it allows us to look at it from, it's almost like you're paying down a loan early, right? Kind of, you know, you, you look at, you know, you say it's a half a million dollar incentive, it's a $3 million project. Yeah. Metris will take on that utility incentive for you, plug that into the model. So you're buying down your, your financeable rates. And what that does, that helps out with term length or energy uh, saving share percentage. Really just depends on what lever we need to pull to make the project work for the customer. So hopefully, hopefully that answers those. Fantastic, super helpful. So the next one is, are the energy savings guaranteed? In other words, how would an underperforming project be handled? Good question. So, um, so energy savings guarantee. So this is not a performance contract where you're locked in to say 10 years and you're guaranteed 80% or 85, 90% by the performance contractor. That's a totally different uh, way of, of, of looking at performance contracting. The, there's no energy savings for the customer. So what that does for us, we Metris has taken that risk of saying, we're going to finance this thing to 100% of expected performance. Now on the side, we have an agreement with Centrica in this case saying, what percentage of performance are you going to guarantee? Is it 90%, 80%? We'll put that in a contract with them, but that does not impact Metris's want or ability to, to still finance and say, hey, we're expecting this thing to go 100% of this energy savings. So we, we take on that risk for the customer. Um, so what that does from, you know, Jim, maybe you can speak to it, but it seems like it, it, it puts a little bit of comfort for someone like yourself and other customers to say, well, Metris needs to make sure that this system is performing and they have a really good contract to work, they're working with. And that's, that's super important for us to align with a customer, or, you know, a customer of ours like Centrica. Plus, I like it, the part that we're only paying for the savings, so for the portion of the savings. Yep. What's the risk on them? Yep. Yep. So yeah, if, if, if it is underperforming, then the customer will only pay for those realized savings. They're not going to over, overpay uh, for, for any type of uh, underperforming system. Hopefully that answered that question. I think we did. Yeah, I think so. So related to that, um, does it differ based on the project or how is the customer um, kind of paying for the savings? It's, you said, a portion of the realized savings is what they pay, but not uh, obviously not the total project cost. 
Right. So it, that that you know that term length is going to be dependent upon energy savings and overall project cost, whatever that simple payback is. You know, and creditworthiness. That's how we'll determine like where we can put that uh, that term out to. Um, so that I think maybe your question, Bridget, is around. Um, does each project have a fixed energy savings percentage? Is that the question, kind of? Like, is it an, in the 50-50 split or an 80-20 split of savings? Because let's just look at it from a dollar standpoint. So let's say a project is expected to save $100,000 in year one. And the project did end up saving $100,000. And in our model with whatever customer, we have a 90% energy, 90-10 uh, split. So what that means is the customer is going to pay us $90,000 in this model, in this scenario here, they're going to cash flow, they're going to, or not cash flow, they're going to keep $10,000 in energy savings in that, in that scenario there. Now that percentage is not fixed. It changes based upon the efficiency of the project. Um, and that's where Mark was kind of mentioning er earlier, those, those levers of what can we open up? What do we have room to play to open up bigger scope of work? You know, that, that uh, helps marking them out with being creative with their approach. Was that, was that the question kind of, or did I miss it? Yeah, no, that's, that's great um, to hear. So it sounds like, you know, what I've heard is that uh, there's a lot of collaboration in creating the agreement up front um, between the customer and Centrica and uh, Metris to make sure that um, everyone is, kind of on board with what's happening and what the scope of the project is, who's paying for what. Um, and it sounds like even just the installations that you mentioned, Jim, some of them were after hours to minimize campus disruption. So a lot of collaboration um, across the scope of the project to make sure that um, everyone is able to, you know, get something productive out of the, the agreement, which is really great to hear. Um, Okay, so one other uh, question came in um, in our last five minutes here, which is you take on renewable energy project financing. Um, it, that's, a, that's a tough one at the moment. Um, I would say let's talk about it uh, offline. I mean, it's, it's, it's very little in our portfolio. It's just a, it's, it's not where we play very well, but um, Depending upon the scope, you know, if there's other things that we could potentially bring into the mix, um, it's something we could consider, but it's not, it's not top of our list. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, anything else, Jim, Mark, or uh, Brian, that you want to share um, with the audience in terms of what you've learned from this, what you want to impart upon people? Um, and then maybe Brian, if you can pull up your screen so that people can see your contact information, that would be wonderful too. I was gonna say, I have no problem if anybody wants to contact me, but Centric has been a great partner in getting the project, working through the whole project and sharing the information from the audit all the way down to the final and then just implementation. I know the facilities department appreciates the pieces that show up every couple months uh, when they do a review. So. Love it. We know that food is always a very good tactic on a college campus, um, I can say from working on a campus. So uh, well done there. Yeah, Mark, Brian, anything else? Yeah, I think to Jim's point, and I think Mark and I may have, may have mentioned it earlier, but you know, taking on these type of projects in some some cases can seem a little daunting for folks, and they may be a little scared to to look at multiple things that don't fit within certain you know return rates within whatever organization that you're in. Uh, that's where you know Mark and I live. You know, we we look at these things and say, you know, this is this is how we can help the customer out. Um, and you know, I think one of the slides mentioned, um, you know, we're the partner for the customer to ensure that the project is done the right way. Um, so to take that, I guess, stress or, 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 or whatever you wanna call it, of thinking about the project uh, off of their plate, I think is, is a big, big important thing for us. And, um, you know, with us, you know, we work with Centrica all the time, but it's very important for us to have a, a trusted partner
partner that we know is going to design and perform uh, and install and, and then the system perform that we expect it to from day one. And then the end result, the customer gets, get that, gets that benefit. Fantastic. I also just put uh, your email address in the chat for folks as well. Um, and we'll include one other link that might be uh, helpful, which is to um, Metris's profile on the Solution Center. Um, so please do visit the Solution Center to learn more as well. We're making a ton of enhancements. Um, Nadia, who's on the call, is doing an amazing job um, updating a lot of profiles and sharing some really wonderful resources. Um, so you'll hear more about that soon. Um, but in the meantime, you can feel free to visit visit the Solution Center and learn more about the, um, some wonderful projects that Metris has done. Um, and I think with that, um, if there's not any other questions, uh, we can um, close out here. We'll stay on for another couple minutes if um, there's any lingering questions. Um, otherwise, we will send this recording out to folks who weren't able to make it today and or for folks who want to share it with others on their team. And thank you so much to Jim, Mark, and Brian for sharing uh, this case study with us and educating um, us on uh, the energy services ag agreements and projects. So thank you so much. No, thank you, Bridget. Great. Thank you. Thank you.